Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we continue our military to manufacturing series and we have with us Mr. Dustin Rogers who is an automation technician at Rockwell. How you doing Dustin? I'm doing pretty good. Just hanging in there. How about yourself? I'm doing good, man. It's a beautiful day in North Carolina. So you're in what? Milwaukee, you said? In Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's bright and sunny out here for a change. Well, that is awesome. That is awesome. We're looking forward to going through this conversation with you and start us off, man. So what branch of the military were you in? I served in the Marine Corps. Naturally, when I was a younger kid, I always wanted to be in the military. Or at least that's what my mother told me. And then um, my stepbrother joined the National Guard, which in everyone's mind is the same thing as the Army. And being the little brother, I had to one-up him. So I ended up in the Marine Corps. After taking my ASVAB test, they told me that I pretty much needed to get a, a technical job because that portion of the ASVAB, they said I blew out of the water. So I ended up choosing uh, aviation electronics on the CH-53 Echo platform. Nice, nice. Well, first of all, thank you for your service. I mean, that's that's awesome. Good job on on your one up of your was it your half brother, your step brother? You said there, step brother. Okay, good job there. And and uh, so, how long were you in? I did three years. I got out medically, and then um, I kind of didn't want to sit around and you know wonder what I was going to do because it all did kind of happen fast. So I went to my first technical college in Ontario, California. It was a the Universal Technical Institute is basically a auto manufacturer school where uh, you learn to work on vehicles. And then if you want, you can specialize in a certain brand. I chose and was accepted to um, spe- specialize in Mercedes. And after I graduated there, I went moved to Alabama for a little bit and worked for Mercedes as an automotive technician. And then decided I'd rather keep working on cars as a hobby, not as a main source of income. So I went back to school again, back to California and went to uh, San Joaquin Valley College. They had a campus also in Ontario. So I went there, studied electrical technology for residential, industrial and commercial wiring. And then after that, I had just graduated. It maybe had been a couple days and a recruiter in Milwaukee contacted me, asked if I would be interested in trying a program out here in Milwaukee for the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, pretty diverse there. I mean, did you enjoy that time at UTI that you, uh, from the the skills that you learned there? Yeah, some of it was, I guess, a bit of a refresher because growing up in Mississippi, you kind of have to work on your own vehicles a lot or it's preferred that you do because no one really wants to take it to a dealership. So, Uh, I grew up doing that most of my life, you know, basic maintenance and stuff. And this just refreshed me on that and then went more in depth to the more complex things you would have to fix. Right. They're not simple Mercedes. I mean, that's, there's a complex machines there. I'll say this. I do like the fact that uh, Mercedes uh, believes in a remove and replace method. If something breaks, just take it out, replace it. Gotcha. No patchwork, huh? Okay. Uh, Yeah. Well, it's called Mercedes for a reason, so I guess that's why, right? Mm-hmm. But the AMGs sure are a lot of fun to drive. I bet, man. I bet. I need to get behind the wheel and, and just test drive one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you were coming out the military. What was that transition like for you to civilian life? Where, you know, where are some areas that you needed support in? Well, I mean, in general, I think it would be so a tad intimidating because it was all happening quickly enough that I didn't really know what I was going to do or where I was going to go. And they do have this program where you go through as you're getting out and, you know, employers come and will talk to you. But in California, that was mainly like corrections and stuff of that nature. And and, uh, the police force were the main ones showing up in which the majority of the people in the program with me at that time None of us were infantry. None of us were 
MPOs or nothing like that. We all did technical work or admin work. So that just didn't interest us. So it's kind of pretty much, a, I don't want to say a waste of time, but it wasn't something highly sought after by the class. So I guess I would say the most help needed as, you know, having more options available to you, getting out more avenues of approach, more ways you could go about into different fields, especially fields that relate to what you worked on in the military for however many years. So I guess just kind of expanding the network and understanding the opportunities that could exist in these new areas. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So when, when you were looking at manufacturing or, or industry in general, what attracted you to that? I'll be honest. I didn't even look at manufacturing at all because in my mind, manufacturing meant I'd get stuck in a plant, you know, never go anywhere because back home, that's all there was, was furniture plants, stuff like that, that my mother, she's worked at my whole life, the same job, the same type of job. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to end up the same way. You know, I wanted to improve and do something a little bit more meaningful to me other than just the same old, same old day in and day out. Right. So, I mean, there's a perception out there that manufacturing is just that, but I think you can attest that that's definitely evolving, correct? It is evolving and it's definitely not what I thought it was going to be. So I will say that I was pleasantly surprised. So what have been some of those surprises, man? You had this perception in your mind before, and now you're, you've gone through it and you're in it. What would be some of the areas that our listeners would be the most surprised to hear about? Well, if you would have asked me about a year and a half ago, hey, you think you could ever work on robots? I'd look at you and, ask, and say, you're crazy. There's no way I could do that. And now I'm the main guy here that works on the robots on our uh, assembly line and fixes them when they um, hit certain faults and whatnot. Um, another one would be learning code. That had might as well have been a dead language to me because I could not have ever imagined understanding anything that had to do with that. But after going through AAM and having some more exposure in the job I have now, I have a, I guess I would say a beginner's grasp on it, but it is definitely something that I know I can improve on and eventually excel in. Right. Absolutely. Now, you've mentioned AAM a few times to our listeners. That's the, the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing. So can you just talk us through the process of being accepted, what that looked like, and what do you remember most about that experience? Well, the first thing I remember and is the first thing that uh, I, I would be willing to bet money that every person that comes through this program will remember is when you first hear about it, you say to yourself, this is a scam. It's not real, and I'm going to be stranded in whatever city they tell me I need to go to. Okay. That is it's just, it's just because it's one of those, everything that they throw at you, it's like, this all sounds too good to be true. And especially coming from the military, you learn to be very skeptical of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but I took a leap of faith, especially after they made me go through so many hoops of taking tests online, because in order to be accepted into the program, um, you have to take three tests could be more, could be less, but I do remember three of them. And you have to score a certain percentage on each test to be accepted. And then after that, you go through the normal, you know, background check, your analysis test, and things like of that nature before you come out to either the Ohio location or the Wisconsin location. And then you start your course, you select the date you want to start. And for me, once I had the ball rolling, I said, I'll take the next available class. And so that's when I came and started. I moved to Milwaukee in January 2019, so last year. And I've just been here ever since. Okay. So what do you remember most about those 12 weeks? That I could make a drive, do the same thing two different ways and still not pass for it. <laughs> you got you to gotta give us more than that, man. <laughs> I know. Um but I thought it's just a little joke I have with some guys from my class because they all know about it. Um, but no, it's definitely uh, I've as I've already explained, I've been on uh, I've been involved with technical courses before and very hands on things. And by far, this was the most hands on course I've ever had. It's not that typical. Oh, you'll get this amount of time in the classroom and this amount of time in uh the lab and then that not come true this is actually you know oh we're going to spend this much time in class and we're going to spend this much time in the lab like directly the second you finish that lesson 
we go into the lab and we start, you know, practicing what we just went over. Right. And trying to get an understanding of it, not just from the book side, but an actual in practice side. And so that's one of the big things I'll always remember is just how in depth and hands on it was to help, I guess, make sure that you truly do have an understanding and not both the book smarts, but actually doing it. Right. Because, I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? And I mean, from a technical standpoint for our listeners out there, give them, a, give them, paint a picture for them on that technical training, what that looked like. So for the course, they brought in pretty much everything that you could be working on in our roles throughout this industry, which was HMIs, drives, PLC programming, things of that nature, building a PLC program in general to control a drive, to control the HMI, or to be controlled by the HMI, rather. So, and networking and creating the right IP address and assigning certain tags to certain things to make, you know, a whole operation run smoothly. Nice. Okay. So, I mean, that sounds pretty intense. Now, I've also saw some of the labs. They look pretty awesome, man. That's cutting edge technology, correct? Yes, correct. As far as I know that everything in the lab is pretty much their latest and greatest. And if not, it's only maybe a generation old. Right. So, I mean, you get into to play and put your hands on the, the stuff that's actually going into the plants now and, and supporting manufacturing. So it just sounds like just an awesome learning experience and environment to educate and to just that hands-on piece is so important, so important. And, and I do have a question. Talking with Mary, she was telling us a little bit about professional side, professional development training. Can you explain to our listeners what that entailed? It's pretty much teaching vets how to talk to civilians again, because we, do, we just we kind of develop a certain lingo in the military. Most of us do anyway. But it's pretty much showing that, hey, you're not in the military anymore. Um, there are certain you have to word things certain ways, but like you can still say the same message, but in a different way, a more tactful, more professional way. So as to not give off the impression that I guess you're not very ethical or um, professional. When in fact you are, it's just sometimes that old military jargon kind of sticks with you without even realizing it. And so it does help us with that. It does help us with planning and progressing in whatever career we're in. Uh, it does help with that. It does also help you learn for those that either go straight into it or eventually progress to a uh, manager's level and has to have a you know high functioning team. It did give you lessons on how to perform that task and create a high performing and efficient team. Okay. So, I mean, I'm guessing it got in areas like conflict management and things like that. Yes. That is awesome. What percentage of the program was around that type of professional development skills versus the technical? So the actual taking time out of class, I would say was the, um, it was in the beginning month that we had a week of, professional training from a coach and everything. And then we had a resume editor coach that we talked to weekly or a professional development coach weekly. And then he turned that person also helped us write our resumes, create our LinkedIn's. If we didn't have one, you know, go take us through the ropes of all that. Ask us how we're doing in the program. Are there any questions of things like that? Or, you know, how to address certain things within the program or, with the management team of the program, how to address certain things with them and, you know, go about it the right way. And then we had a follow-up week with the same coach in person that we went and did like a few different exercises than we did before and also talked and had more of an open discussion and overall just got a better grasp of, I guess, the things that we had gone through so far to that point. Very good. I mean, that, that sounds like just great opportunities to learn more about yourself and how to plug in with others, how to stand out from a crowd. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it just sounds like a, a great investment of time and, and to help you in that progression there. So the person that's maybe listening right now, Dustin, and they want to pursue more, what advice would you give them if they want to look at this path? I would say just to give the recruiters a call or if you are approached by a recruiter, Obviously, don't say yes right away. Do your research. Make sure that you know what you're going to get yourself involved in. And after doing that research and you deciding, you know what, 
you know, I could be good at this or this is something I could see myself doing for a good portion of the near and or far future, then I would say absolutely go for it and um, come in with your best foot forward and pay attention, listen, because some of it is, well, it's pretty dry. No matter how much the instructors spice it up to make it interesting, it's just some of it will be dry, but it will help you in the long run to remember it as much as you can from every course. Right. I mean, some of the blocking and tackling, you just got to learn, right? You just got to know how to do that mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, that, you know, you've gone through it, you've come out of it, you're now working full time for Rockwell Automation. You know, now that you've done that, where do you find you're getting the most fulfillment in your job, man? For me personally, it's just, you know, I love, I've always loved to work with my hands, fix things with my hands, you know, have a little bit of a thinking process and figure out what I should do to fix it now, but then also what I should do to improve it so it doesn't need to be fixed as often or at all in the future or, and to make a process more efficient. Um, and that is exactly what I'm getting to do here now is that on the line that I work on, there are some bugs in the line still. And so we are working to one, create a solution, a permanent solution for those bugs, as well as addressing, I guess, like minor design flaws that need to be changed to help with that process as well. And I have been brought into it as a key voice on it because I work with it every day and I'm the one that has to go in and fix the faults and, you know, clear out anything that may have have jammed up in the process. Right. Okay. That sounds, that sounds like a a lot of fun, man. And and getting your hands involved and you're part of the solution. Uh, Any highlights you got from a career standpoint you'd like to, uh, to share with our listeners? I mean, I'm still pretty new. Here at Rockwell, I mean, I've, I hit my year mark in April, so I'm still working my way through the waters here, but um, I'm also still very involved with AAM. You know, I go to speak with every new class here in Milwaukee just to give them a little bit of words of encouragement and then, you know, or answer any questions they may have. So I do stay involved with them. I am involved with communications with Mary as well as one of the instructors at AAM. And ultimately, if in a perfect world, it'd be nice to facilitate my way back to AAM to continue to give back to the program that gave me so much. So in such a short amount of time. No doubt. That's awesome that you recognize that. And that, and I'm sure just you coming in and talking to the, the new class, you know, just provides that much more inspiration, man. So that's, that's wonderful. And, and, you know, Dustin, we love to take these episodes and, and, learn a little bit about, you know, you outside of your work life and your, and your career. So how about any hobbies, anything you want to share, any interests that you'd like to uh, talk about? I'll tell you what, thanks to this job, I've been able to um, put a lot of focus on disc golf. My shoulder may not approve of that, but I do. I do play a lot of that, especially since the season is closing down. I'm getting in as many tournaments as I can before we're shut down for the winter. Outside of that, you know, I'd love to go play pool or go for a swim. That's about all I can do right now, especially with uh, the way things are. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, so the, your disc golf, the tournaments are still happening? Yes, they're still happening because on each card, there's no more than four people. And if someone's that worried about it, they can, you know, obviously keep their distance from everyone else on the card. Right. And they can also wear a mask. I mean, that is voluntary, but you have to sign a waiver saying you acknowledge, you know, you're in control of your own health. So you do whatever you feel is right. Um, right. But yeah, like I just played a tournament last week, last weekend, and I have another tournament this weekend and I have league as well on Thursday. So it's going to be a jam packed schedule for a couple more weeks of disc golf. Wow, man. So how long have you been doing that? I originally started playing back home when I was about 12, 13. I played it up until I graduated high school and then left for the military, took some years off and then I picked it up again last year and then this year was my first serious year back and i started competing like i'm a member of the pdga the professional disc golf association that sounds fancy but I, my rank is amateur so let's not get ahead of ourselves and me but convinced it's, man it's your pro so, you know. <laughs> well i haven't won a tournament yet but i've gotten pretty close i got fourth in my first and then i got seventh on my most recent and surprisingly you can win money at it so that's always nice so, you know, I'm not that familiar. So what do you enjoy the most about it? Is it being that the outside, the, the uh, competitiveness of it? I mean, what, what draws you to the sport? Well, it's something that 
my mother introduced to me when I was younger. And then it's something I always had fun with, even though I wasn't that great at it, especially until I started taking it seriously. But then, yes, and then I have a friend here in Milwaukee that me and him are, are two very competitive people. And so it's a nonstop competition. Even when we say, hey, let's just go for a fun round, it turns into a competition anyway. And then we go and compete in tournaments to see how we stack up against players that are rated higher than we are. And I love the outdoors, always have. And it, this is just an excuse for me to be outdoors for hours at a time. And it keeps me moving. And the older I get, the more I can't stand just sitting still and not doing anything. Yeah. So it encompasses everything I want to do. And plus, it's something I know. I'll be able to do well into my fifties and if sixties, you know, willing that my body can take it at that point. Now, last question on this, cause I'm just not that familiar with the topic. So how long does it take? What does the typical round uh, take from a time standpoint? So that depends on a few factors. One, how crowded the course is and two, how good your shots are, honestly, and the length of the course also. So I, there's this one course that we love to go to. It's 36 holes. And that easily takes us, you know, three to four hours to play one round. But on a normal 18 hole course, you could take as long as you're not, you know, in a bunch of traffic as far as people playing in front of you, you can knock out a round with decent shots consistently in about an hour and a half. Okay. And it's just rules. The rules are set up just as the same as normal golf. You have, you know, bogeys, pars, birdies, eagles, and aces, which I just recently got an ace and won a little bit of money at it nice now so, is it like regular golf if you get an ace you have to uh take care of cocktails for everybody in your party that night no i hit it in league so i had to bring a 30 pack to league the next week ah and, uh, you know share okay. share the love share the love i feel you okay well thanks for walking us down the, the the this golf conversation there that's new to me i'm sure it may be new to some of our listeners and we also just like to take a chance to learn more about your families, anything you about you mentioned your mom that she was in manufacturing. Was there any anything else you like to, to share with our listeners? Well, she's also the reason I love uh working on cars because growing up she used to work on her old little Fiero. I don't know if you remember what those were. Oh yes. But but uh she did all her own maintenance on that thing and uh that's where I got that from. But now I'm mainly just being told what to do by her and my five year old daughter. Okay, awesome. So, so you got uh, a couple women running your life. You very similar pretty, to me. Pretty much. Yep. They uh, they tell me what to do, and I just say okay. I don't even fight it anymore. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, she's uh, she moved to Mississippi before I was born, and then just pretty much stayed there in my hometown ever since. And I go back to visit as often as I can. And my daughter's currently in Virginia, and. I'm getting ready, actually, to head out there for her birthday in a, about a month and a half. Okay. Well, i got to just find a Lego costume. <laughs> You'll find it. You'll find it. It's important. Oh, absolutely. You've really brought a lot of insight and inspiration, I'm sure, to some listeners out there that, that are wanting to know how to go from military, what my next steps are. And this sounds like this is a great opportunity to investigate, to learn more about. Uh, we'll put all that in the show notes. But we'd love to wrap up the Eco Ask Why with the why, where we get down to the purpose. So can you give our listeners the importance of why a program like this has had on uh, the impact in your life? What would that be? This definitely opens the door for someone like me who can look at, you know, industries and say, all right, I can go to this. I could try this industry, but I don't know a lot that much about it, but it does interest me. That's what manufacturing was for me. It was I did have some predispositions to it to where I said if I do this, I like if I start to get, you know, in a rut to where they're never gonna let me advance or I'm just gonna keep doing the same thing day in and day out, you know, I'm gonna get out of this industry as soon as possible. But they actually go into depth. They talk about yes, and they will admit that old manufacturing, some of it was like that. But nowadays, you know, companies don't want people to be stagnant. They want them to continuously to grow and continuously improve and better themselves, in which case is also bettering said company. Like Rockwell is a perfect example of that. Um, we have to go through reviews all the time for it. You know, what have you done? What can you improve on? And uh, what are your next steps for your next goals? So that is one thing that is why I'm happy I did this. Another thing is just, 
it opens, I mean, at the very worst, it trains you and it opens up doors for you in case, even if you decide that, hey, this actually isn't for me right now, it's not something I want to pursue at this time, you have that training, you have that knowledge, and some of it, whether you realize it at that time or not, will carry over into most industries that you'll go to work in, whether it be the professional side of things or the hands-on sides of things, you know, fixing issues with either your hands or emails, whichever one, you'll be trained to do both. Right. Cause it, and it's all, cause all those skills are important. So, I mean, thank you so much, Dustin. I mean, this has been great. Just your sharing your journey, how you got here. You have many wonderful things in front of you and your career and your future. And we wish you nothing but the best from eco S Y and just thank you again for just taking the time with us today. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to eco S Y. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.